Since the Alzheimer's diagnosis, I've had a lot of time with my dad, and I'm very grateful for that time. And I know he's watching at home tonight, and so hi, Dad, I'm, I'm glad you're with us. Um, I have an interesting relationship with my dad, because he's, not only did we walk through life together growing up, but uh, I got to work with him, too, for pretty much my whole work life. And so we have a, a, an interesting relationship, and, and I'm very grateful for that because it, in a few years, our, our church is going to be 50 years old, and I got to be here as a little boy as it, as it started. And uh, as I've been talking with my dad and spending time with him, I, I began to think about some Bible verses that he repeated over and over and over again, that when this church was planted... On the first day, four people were here. So it was just like, he, he just, these four verses, like I could, I could say them in my sleep. He'll probably know them as soon as I say them. But I was just thinking about these verses, and I want to talk about each verse in the, the next few weeks as we begin a new year. But it was a different time when this church was birthed. It was the 1970s, right there in the middle of the 70s. And it was the Jesus People movement. I don't know if you remember that time, but... Uh, uh, you know, it's funny because my dad is a pretty buttoned-up, three-piece suit kind of guy, and there were people coming to church with long hair, long beards, no shoes, and uh, it was just like a wild time. It was a charismatic movement, um, just manifestations, and all these amazing things were taking place. The world was in trouble. I mean, we were talking Vietnam War and, and Watergate and all those different things at that time, and, and, and yet my dad felt the call to come out here to what he always refers to as a dinky church, this, this small church to come out here and that, that he would teach the word of God because God was moving and people were getting saved through the Jesus people movement, but nobody was discipling them. No one was teaching them like line by line. And he goes, I'm, I'm supposed to teach them. And they would have these, this music, but, but nobody was worshiping. Like now you go to church, pretty much you go to any church and they're going to close their eyes and lift their hands and sing the songs we sing. But that didn't happen back, you know, in the 70s. Like, that was special. And so my dad just, I remember he said the first day, he goes, I don't know if anybody's going to worship, but he just closed his eyes and lifted his hands and just started worshiping. He's like, we're going to be a worshiping church and a teaching church. And we went to this small little church. And, in fact, we didn't even move from the city out here right away because my dad didn't know if it would take off, but it did because it was small and, and mighty. And I got a front row seat as a little boy to watch what God did, to watch something get birthed. And what I realized back then and I realized today as we move into the future that this church and the church, so I'm not saying our church is special, I'm saying the church of, of Jesus Christ, we're on a mission. And sometimes we forget that. Sometimes we forget that, that we're not just to be here to be here for next year and to get through this year and then have something good for our kids and then their kids and we just keep it going. No, we have a mission. And someday that mission will be complete. And when the mission is complete, Jesus will return to take us to be with him. But until that time, we are on mission and we are here to glorify Jesus. We are here to make disciples. We are here to preach the good news to all nations. We are here to proclaim that there is good news. We're here to say there is a new king and a new kingdom that has come, but is coming again. Like that we have something that we are called to do as a church. We are on mission. We don't just get to go year by year and just, okay, week by week. And we're just, no, we're on mission to do something big for God, and we can't lose sight of that calling. And so I want to look at a few verses that, that my dad would just repeat over and over again, and I don't want us to to lose our way. So I want to go back to some of these verses, and they're true for the church, yes, but they're true for our lives. And so I'm going, to, I'm going to share the first one with you, and if you were part of our church from the early days, if my dad said this verse once, he said it a, a million times, Psalm 127.1, unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. I don't even know how many times my dad said that. In one sermon, let alone in those first few years, unless the Lord builds a house, the builders labor in vain. I think about that, unless God's at work, it's not going to work. 
We can't do this without God. That's what my dad was saying. This won't work without God. And it's not just the church. Your life won't work without God. Look what it says in the Message Bible. If God doesn't build the house, the builders only build shacks. Isn't that interesting? Like, if you don't have God, you're not going to build anything great. You're, you're going to build what you can build. But unless the Lord builds it, it's not going to go. So three questions to ask ourselves. When we look at that verse, if, if God doesn't build the house, what are we building? That's the first question. I want you to ask yourself, what are you building? There's so many areas of our life, and we kind of compartmentalize them, and, and one area doesn't touch the other area. So, like, we have a work life, a school life, we have a home life, we have a social life, we have a church life, and there's so many more than that, but we have all these different compartmentalized parts of our, our life, and, and each one has its own structure and its own people and its own way of doing things. And like I said, they rarely ever touch. They're just different compartments, different parts of our life. Um, I don't know if we have any Seinfeld fans in, in uh, church tonight, and I would normally never give a Seinfeld illustration, but this one fits. So uh, the, the episode where, where George has like his girlfriend meeting his friends and work friends, and, and he starts going, world's colliding, world's, he just gets so, world's colliding, they're not supposed to know each other, they're not supposed to tell you, like, the, that all of his worlds were colliding, all of them were coming together, as one. and he's like, I don't like this, it doesn't fit, it doesn't feel right, and that's how we live most of our life, like, I've got this compartment, and this compartment, and this compartment, and I don't act the same way at work that I do at home, or I do at church, it's like, these are different places, and the word is telling us, unless the Lord builds the house, and he's not talking about our house or our homes, and he's not just talking about our church, he's actually talking about our lives. Unless the Lord builds it, it's, you're laboring in vain, and it's got to be every area of your life. All of the compartments need to collide, right? It's like, it just, you have to give him everything. Because that's what God's talking about. He's talking about everything. He goes, I want you to put me in the middle of everything. This is what I want you to write down. First thing, God wants a hand in building every part of your life. He wants a hand in building every part of your life. And it's important that we give him this kind of way in our life, because if we don't, Listen, only what he will build, only what he builds will last, right? I mean, he already said that. Like, if, if you're not letting him build, you're laboring in vain. And so I've got to give him every part of my life. I've got to allow him to work at every part of my life. I don't want to labor in vain. I want him in every area of my life. The next question is, is it God or is it you? Is it God or is it you? Because there's two ways to build, right? There's... There's two ways we can build. One is we can move ahead with our own plans. And, and so we can do our very best and have our good ideas. And this is what we can do and accomplish and pay for on our own. And then we, we kind of put our plan together. And then we say, oh, God, would you please bless our plan, right? That's one way of doing it. Or we can wait until the Lord gives us direction. Wait for him to say, okay, this is the way I want you to go. This is the way I want you to walk. And then when we walk in his way, that's when the supernatural begins to happen. That's when miraculous circumstances start coming together, right? You start meeting the right people at the right time. God starts providing financially for what you need to do. It's like all of a sudden when I wait on his plan and I do it his way, He's the one doing the building. Like, I can build in my own strength, or I can build in the supernatural strength of God. It, it makes all the difference in the world if I'm building or if God's building. I've got to let him do the building. Uh, just the other week, I, I got the book from uh, Lars Svensson. Uh, and Lars was here from the very beginning, the early days, 94 years old. And he actually just wrote a book about all of his missionary travels um, and... Uh, Lars uh, worked in cement his whole life, owned his own company, and so he'd work most of the year, but obviously in the winter months you couldn't uh, pour cement, and so in the winter months he would leave and he would go overseas and he would build churches. He built hundreds of churches and 
and orphanages and uh, blessed thousands upon thousands of people all over the world. And so he wrote a book. It's kind of a journal of all of his times doing this. And uh, he started an organization called Laymen Committed to Missions International. And so uh, he got all of his building buddies that he knew to come on these trips. And, um, and guys like me who have no skill whatsoever to come on trips with him to, to be the slave labor, basically, and, uh, and do what we're told. But um, so when I got the book in the mail from Lars, I, I opened up to see the trips I was on and, and to see all the things that God did. And as, as I was reading through this book, what was interesting was it was just miracle after miracle how God provided. Like, like they just, they paid for everything. They would, they, would, they would pay their way. They would pay to build the church. They would pay to buy the tools, and they'd usually leave all their tools over there. When they got there, they just... They just gave their lives away and built, like I said, hundreds of churches, blessing thousands of people, and saw miracle after miracle after miracle. And that's something that our churches believed in from the very beginning, the idea of missions, the idea of going out and doing what God called us to do around the world, because we're we're to preach the good news to every tribe and every tongue. And so I want us to surrender our lives to God. Surrender your life to God. That's what I want you to do. Surrender your life to God because when you do, Lars did that many years ago. Now he's in his 90s and can't do it anymore, but now he writes about some of the miracles that happened. But we need each one of us to surrender our lives because when we do, something happens. I think of the feeding of the 5,000. And everybody remembers the little boy who gave his lunch to Jesus. Now, if that boy would have shared that lunch with the people around him, he probably would have fed a family, right? Like, He would have blessed the people that were immediately around him. But when he took his lunch and he put it in the hands of Jesus, it fed the multitude. Because he gave what he had to the Lord. He surrendered what he had to the Lord. And when you surrender your life to the Lord, you will see miracle after miracle after miracle. God will take that seed and he will bless it in amazing way. You will begin to not just impact the people around you, but the people that you don't even know. And, and, and here's, a, here's another thing. Everything in the kingdom of God begins with a seed. Everything in the kingdom of God begins with a seed. That I plant that seed. I, plant, I surrender my life to God. I plant that seed. I, I plant my, my purpose, my meaning, my giving. When I, when I give all of myself to God, he is going to do something supernatural. He will bless it. The next question to ask is, what will be the result if, if I say, okay, God, I'm not going to labor in vain. I want you to build the house. But when you finally say, God, I want you to build my, my home. I want you to build what I do at work. I want my church life. I want to be dependent on you and your work. You know, when we, when we give it to God, see, you and I are limited, and God's not, right? God's not limited. We're limited. He's not. And so we have to realize that when I build on him, good things are going to happen. When, when he's the builder, good things are going to happen. I think of Matthew chapter 7 and the, the, the parable in the Sermon on the Mount, the only parable in the Sermon on the Mount, where he talks about the, the wise and the foolish builder. The foolish builder builds his life on the sand. And when the storm comes, it wipes out the house because there's no foundation to that house. And the wise one builds his house on the rock, right? And the winds and the waves come and they beat against it and it stands because it was built on the rock. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain that build it. Like, I want to build it with, with what God tells me to do. And a lot of times we think, well, that's saved people and unsaved people. Like, the like people that don't know God, they build their house on the sand. But that's not what Jesus said. He said, those who hear my words and obey them are the ones who built their life on the rock. So, so you don't just get a free pass. So you say, okay, Jesus, you're my Savior, and everything will be rosy. No, you, you have to listen and obey. You have to hear his voice and put it into practice. Build your life on the rock. Let the Lord build your life. Let him build the enti- your entire life because it matters, not just today, but tomorrow and to all of eternity, that God is doing the work in your life. I want to give you three things, three things as we, we think about this passage of Scripture. Number one, don't labor in vain. Don't labor in vain. Don't do it on your own. He said, unless I build the house. Just don't 
build your work life and your home life, and then, well, I'll give God my church life. No, give it all to him. Just give him your social life. Give him everything. Give him, give him everything tonight, right? Just, just say, okay, God, you got it all. Don't labor in vain. Number two, God isn't just the best builder. He's the only builder, the only successful builder. Again, back to unless the Lord builds a house, only he is the true builder. Like, unless the Lord builds a house, you're going to labor in vain, and then we build better together with him. We build better together with him. There's a passage of scripture I, I want to give you because it's not just together with him because I want us to build together with him, but I think we built better together together with him. Matthew 27, or Matthew 25, 37 through 40. This is at the end times teaching of Jesus, the separation of the sheep and the goats. And in verse 37, it says, Then the righteous will answer him, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you? Or thirsty and give you something to drink? When did we see a stranger invite you in? Or needing clothes and clothe you? When were you sick or in prison and we went to visit you? The king will reply, Truly I tell you, whatever you did for the least of these my brothers and sisters, you did for me. See, we are called to be Jesus to this world, right? That's the mission of the church. To go into all these places and preach to the least of these. And on that day, you may say, well, when did I do that? When did I, when did I go to the least of these? And, and you'll be part of what Lars did for so many years because you gave to missions. And, and, and you didn't even know you were giving to missions, but when you gave to the church, we give, we give like a whole offering every month, just, just out, straight out the door to missionaries. And it's like, when did I ever do that? No, you did it. When did I ever visit anybody in prison? Well, Carrie, Right? We have prison ministry here at the church. I know it's a little weird with COVID and, and all of that, but, but, but how many people are blessed through devotionals or visits or letters or things that, that, that people in the church do? I, I think about all those things. I, when do we ever see you hungry? God will say, you saw me every week on Friday when, when people would pull up to get food. When do we ever clothe you? Well, every Wednesday when the, the pantry was open and the kids came and got what they needed. When do we ever do this? We did it together, right? I want you to understand we're on mission together. And, and one, we are not a church where one person does everything. No, there's different people doing different things in the house of God. It's always been that way. All the way back even to the Old Testament, God put different people in different places to do different things for him. And, and yet we do it all together. And we do it for him together better. And I love it because... If you want to write this down, you were created by God on purpose for a purpose. You were created by God on purpose for a purpose. And when I grab hold of that and I begin to walk in that and you begin to walk in that, there's this connection that begins to happen where it's, it's, this, it's mysterious because God's sovereign and he's at work and unless he builds a house... But also when I say, okay, God, whatever you ask me to do, I'm going to do it. And this, this, this mystery of God's sovereignty and, and us saying, okay, God, I'm all in. Whatever you want me to do, however you wired me, that's how I'm going to live my life. And, and you just you come together and great things are done because you've submitted the gift and the purpose that he put inside of you. Those gifts are, are without repentance. The people that don't follow God, they still get to use their gift, but they're laboring in vain. See, when we put our gift in his hands, when we put our purpose in his hands, we are laboring, and God is blessing us, and, and, and we just, we're just dependent on him. Okay, God, unless you build it, nothing's going to happen. Again, write it down. We live this day for that day. We live this day for that day. Like everything that's happening today in every area of your life, unless the Lord builds a house, we labor in vain. It's like, God, I don't want to miss out in the end. God, whatever you're doing today, I want to be a part of it. God, I want to be a part of what you're doing right now because I'm living today for that day. I'm living for that moment where I hear well done, where I hear, hey, thank you. When you did it unto the least of these, you did it unto me, that we are living this day for that day. Obviously, reflecting a lot on family, on life, and, and not just my dad. I've been thinking about my grandpa Merrill, his dad. And um, so when I was a little boy, uh, I'd go to my grandparents' house in Iowa in the summer. Now, that's very different than Chicago, going to Iowa for the summer. And I'd go with my grandpa and grandma Merrill. My grandpa and grandma Merrill, they were older, and my grandpa had Parkinson's disease, and 
that it slowed him down quite a bit. But I remember every morning at breakfast time, we'd be just sitting around the kitchen table, and he'd just have his Bible open, and he'd just, he'd just be reading the Word, not out loud, just, just to himself, just spending that time with God, communing with the Lord. And then he would say, okay, it's time to pray for the day. And the thing about my grandpa is he prayed as though Jesus was sitting at that table. It was just, it was, I've never heard anyone pray like that. Just, just right that Jesus was right there. And he said the same phrase every morning, first words out of his mouth, part, first part of the prayer. Lord, we've never walked this day before. But God, you're with us every step. I just love that. We've never gone this way before. We're sitting at the beginning of a brand new year. Say, we've never gone this way before. That's actually from the Bible when the children of Israel are going into the promised land. They'd never gone that way before, right? They had gone in circles a lot. But then they had to pray, God, we're doing something new now. We're going in a direction that we've never gone before. And God, we need you to walk with us. And I believe as we walk into a new year and we say, I'm not going to build my life anymore. I am going to submit and surrender to the builder. And God, I've never walked this year before. I've never walked this way before. But God, you're with me every single step. That's what God's asking us to do. I think of this verse what is a profit of man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? That I get everything I want out of life. But unless he's the builder, I'm doing it for nothing. I don't want to miss out on God's best. There's a verse in 1 Timothy in the Living Bible. It says some of these people have missed the most important thing in life. They don't know God. You know God. You haven't missed the most important thing in life. But now it's our time to surrender our lives to the one who will lead, who will guide, who will build things that will last forever. And so I want to just pray a prayer of commitment, and I want to do something uh, a little bit different in just a moment. But I just want us to pray. Would you bow your heads and your hearts with me just for a moment? And I want you just to surrender to the Lord, to surrender your life to the Lord. Maybe you've done that before, maybe you haven't. I'm just going to ask you to surrender your life to the Lord, to pray a prayer of commitment so that you can say on New Year's Eve 2022, I prayed this prayer, I said this prayer. And it doesn't matter if you're here in the room, if you're watching online, if you're listening later, it doesn't matter. This is the moment. We want you to write it down. This is the moment you said, no more. No more of building my way. We're going to build his way. Because if I build my way, I am laboring in vain. It is just mere flesh and blood. But if I am allowing God to build in my life, it's supernatural. We're going to surrender our lives to the Lord now in just this simple prayer. And I'm going to ask everyone to pray and repeat this after me. A prayer of commitment right now. Repeat these words. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I need your forgiveness. I believe that you died for my sins. I want to turn from my sin. I now invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust and follow you as my Lord and Savior. In Jesus' name, amen, amen.